what's going on, everybody? And welcome back to another week of the Embracing Organic Show, the show where we try and get you to be a little more organic in your daily practices. So I'd like to welcome another special guest to this week's show, Tyler from Family Tree Seeds. What's going on, Tyler? How are you doing this week? Doing great, man. Doing great. It's a pleasure to have you with us, man. Thanks for making it out. No, thanks for having me, man. It's my pleasure. All right. So um, for those of you who might not know Tyler, um, Tyler does a lot of breeding work with outdoor plants, if I'm correct, right? You do a lot of outdoor work? Yep. And yep. Uh, probably most famous for your Pam F1 that you've done your work, that you've done work with? Yeah, the Pam Anderson, yeah. Okay. A lot of different things happen with the Pam. So, so yeah, it's probably what you're probably uh, more famous for, I guess you could yeah. say. And uh, yeah. yeah, man, welcome to the show. And let me not try and speak for you. Let's let you speak for yourself and get into it, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Right on, man. Um, I'm Tyler. They call me Mr. Trees. Uh, I'm uh, down here in San Diego, California. I'm a fruit tree or an orchard, home orchard specialist. So I, uh, I travel around. I look at different fruit trees all day from avocados, mangoes, citrus, peaches, plums, you name it. Here in San Diego, we grow everything. So um, I have a pretty full schedule looking at trees, which is nice. And when I'm looking at trees, there's a lot of people that like to plant a garden. So over the years, I've met a lot of a lot of cool cats that, that put in orchards and also put in medical gardens for themselves. So I get free testers along the way, and I get to see a lot of different places and a lot of different effects on a lot of my, my strains that I work on. That's awesome, man. Uh Looks like you have, might be having a little yeah, bit of a connection issue over there. That was a heck, no one. All right, we got you back. Looks like you had a little. We lost connection you for a there. minute there, man. Sorry. <laughs> Looks like we had a little bit of connection. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. It's all good. So you, yeah, yeah. You uh, we kind of lost you where where you were saying like you're going around checking different uh, people's trees and you see their garden and then they they give you tester seeds. That's kind of where we lost you at. Yeah, yeah. So like you know I. I've been growing and breeding cannabis since I was a little kid. I've uh, been in a relationship with the plant since I was 15 years old or so. So uh, uh, along the way, I've created a lot of funny little strains and seeds. And and, and with my business, I've, I've been able to incorporate ganja and fruit in a, in a home setting. So I get to see a lot of my strains in action in a lot of different places. So it's pretty, pretty unique. That's pretty cool, man. So, like, uh, were you going around, like, testing fruit trees and all that? Or you're doing, like, soil analysis and stuff, too, I'm assuming? Yeah, well, I mean, it could be anything from soil analysis to my tree is sick, what, what's happening. So, I come, we do an on-site evaluation. You know, we look at things. A lot of the time, it's just improper care, you know, uh, not, not planted correctly, not, you know, fed correctly, not watered correctly, things like that. Uh, sometimes you have certain insects that are seasonal that will come through and make it look like you've got a horrible disease. So insect identification, uh, soil analysis, um, orchard installation. I specialize on like <clears throat> getting people to utilize their, their small space to plant a lot of different fruit trees that ripen at different times so that you're always pulling something off the tree and able to have something on the table. Okay. Um, you know, so like so, you know, every month you, you're harvesting something kind of like in cannabis, you know, you've got a, a, an ever going cycle where you're always kind of pulling stuff off. Uh, I set that up with with fruit. So uh, based on their seasonal. Um, so you right. kind of took like some of the essentials from like square foot gardening and stuff like that. Yeah. A lot you're of trying to pack gardening. things in really tight and then, you know, some are going to yeah, bloom early, some are going to bloom late. Yeah, they call it they call it backyard orchard culture. You know, we'll do everything. We even, you know, put two or three trees in, in a hole, uh, in the same hole together. Uh, you know, like say three peaches. You know, they have to be like items, they have to have the same root stocks. There's a lot of little rules that you should follow in order to do it successfully. Um, but essentially you're putting say three different trees in, in the same hole, all you know, say peaches, right? One peach will ripen ripens in May, the other one ripens in June, the next one ripens in July or something along those lines. And you can do that with every type of uh, fruit along the way. If you got a small space or if you got a large space, I don't recommend doing that. You know, single trees are always better, but mm -hmm. it's just utilizing their space because the food that we buy is poison and the stuff we can pull out of the ground is, is the way it should be. So, um, hey man, you're, you're speaking my heart right now. That's what I do. <laughs> you, about are, it. you are speaking <laughs> my heart right now. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, man, welcome to the show. So thanks, man. Let's just uh, say hi to the rest of our panelists, and we'll uh, we'll get into your cannabis. Go ahead and you want to hit that uh, dab bell there, Mister Tanasi. I don't think we've heard that yet. Ooh, I got one in. I don't know if it came through earlier. There it is. Yeah. Hey, dabs up, everybody. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> How you doing tonight, Mister Tanasi? What's going on? We're good over here, man. We could use a couple more buckets of rain, but you know what's up, dude? We're living in the high desert of Colorado, bro. I was able to see the sky today for about the first time in about 10 days. The fires have had it pretty smoky from here all the way up to Fort Collins, pretty much. Actually, it's probably down in Pueblo as well. Yeah, we could see it. I was up in Denver yesterday. It's much worse up there, but it's down here as well. Damn, son, you should have hit me up. I got a Chernobyl sitting in a one-gallon pot. Oh, man, it was, it was a quick trip. Didn't have time. Didn't have, it was a hit and go. <laughs> I'll come back. I'll be up uh, there this weekend. I'm out. I'm going to Montrose tomorrow. Woo. I'm out. And I'll see you Monday. Cheers, everybody. I hope everybody's going to have a great weekend. Hell yeah, cheers. So Mr. Tanasi's going camping this weekend. Kind of jealous of him. I love going outdoors and hanging out with buddies. It'd be fun, but, but there's a fire ban. So I've never been camping with a fire ban. That's interesting. Yeah, that would be a, a bit weird not being able to do campfires. It is different. It is different, but it's very tactical. It's I'm really going to test your skills. Here. Yeah, in in the army, you do a lot of cold camps where you're on missions where you can't have a fire. You should probably recommend everybody to dip as well. Cigarette smoke will get you caught too. But yeah, cold camping. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an interesting weekend. So moving it on down, Mr. Black Sale Market. What's going on, Keith? How you doing this week? Um, I'm doing good. I think cold camping is some crazy shit. Anytime, anytime <laughs> of the year in Denver, don't fool yourself. Even on the hottest summer day in the mountains and the city, if you're out in those mountains at night, man, it gets cold. <laughs> cold like you would not believe it is a rugged scary place where you definitely want to have a fire and hey, what um, was that july tents. we went <laughs> july 4th and we were shivering in our tents yeah yeah it was crazy but uh yeah man everything's going great over here dude i'm just building lights and working on the garden and uh hanging out and having a good time Hell yeah, um, man. Glad to be here with my boys. Glad to see Rasta Bob hopping in. And uh, everybody, remember to hit that thumbs up and hit subscribe. Support the show and make sure you get access to all of our educational and entertaining content. Um, and in chat, be sure to switch from top chat to live chat. Otherwise, you won't see all the conversations. Peace. Thank you for that, Keith. Appreciate it. So moving it on down, Mr. Fumador from Fumador and the Flavors. What's going on this week? How you doing, buddy? This week. Cheers, guys. Uh, let me think. Oh, before I forget anything else, I, I uh, need to spit it out real quick. Uh, the Portland Cannabis Tasting Society, and I guess that's me, are doing a photo contest called Our Dank Photo Contest. Uh, post something, hashtag Our Dank Photo Contest, and you're going to win an amazing pack of freaking seeds from Ross to Jeff called Strawberry Starburst, Strawberry Fields by Our Eyes. I'm speaking in some kind of a weird way because I'm actually sad to give them away. They're fire-ass seeds, guys. Someone has to win it. It's going to be somebody with an amazing photograph or drawing or whatever else, whatever, I'll leave it at that. Oh, a drawing, huh? Dude, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be a photograph. It doesn't have to be a professional camera photograph. It could be an iPhone photograph. It could be a music piece for all I care. It could be someone sit singing on their guitar. Just tag me, our dank photo contest. That's all it takes. Cheers, guys. It's that there simple. Be crafty, fuckers. Oh, end date, we're looking at uh, September 8th. So it's going to be Tasting Tuesday, Portland Campus. Tasting Society, Tasting Tuesday. The winner will be announced that evening. So that's how long you guys have. Post away. So are y'all doing meets out in town, or is this like a virtual meet? They're all virtual now, man. Virtual. New times, new times, new rules, new everything, new whatever. We're actually changing the name a little bit, or I'm changing. I don't know why I'm calling it we all the time. Uh, we're doing it at Chronic Table because people are often confused, like, oh, I'm not from Portland. Can I join you guys? And well, of course we can, so that's why we're changing the name. I've talked, I've talked too much. Under Ross, Jeff, go for it. 
Oh, hey. <laughs> you just surprised the crap out of RJ. Hi. Hi, I'm Ross to Jeff. I'm over here packaging up seeds, not paying any attention. Uh, I was trying to think of cool names. I was thinking the tasting portal. Uh, the tasting table is something that's there. The portal is virtual. Yeah, you can have it. That's yours. Uh, that's my gift to you. That's my contribution for the day. What's up, guys? I'm hanging out. Obviously stoned as fuck. I took a dab just a moment ago that uh, wrecked my shit. Uh, so I'm hanging out, trying to count to 10, getting these seeds packed up for you guys. Um <clears throat> Everybody wants to know if I harvested the Jack the Ripper seeds yet. Yes, I cut them down, but they're not going to be ready for a long time. Uh, Jack the Ripper to Arise. Uh, Jack the Ripper to Lemon Skunk. Jack the Ripper to Golden Goat. Jack, Jack the, Ripper the Ripper to all types of shit that you want. There should be Jack some the magic Ripper in there. Jack the Ripper to Lemon Skunk is going to be like weapons grade lemons and skunk. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, I'm excited grade. about frosty the... Frosty beyond all frostiness. The Blueberry Cookies Jack the Ripper is what's really oh, got my goodness. attention. Yeah, look at Bob's face. Bob's excited about That's those gonna, crosses. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. Rastafari. It's going to be like see you, neon Bridget. blueberries and lemons. And, oh my God. Yeah, one of the Jack the Ripper phenotypes, the females, smells like a key lime pie. It oh. smelled so good. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, there's a lot of cool shit coming out. So I'll be testing those, and then we'll see what's going on. Lemon meringue pie. Uh, it was more limey. More limey. I said it was, when I first smelled it, it smelled like a dairy product. It's like there's dairy and lemons, and then it all came to me. That's how my name schemes come up. All right, guys, thanks for having me. I'll shut up and let somebody else have an intro now. <laughs> all right. Moving on down to the other awesome Rasta on the panel. Rasta Bob, what's going on, Bob, on the job? Ah, uh, Blessings, everybody. Just everyone is doing good. Lots of respect, lots of love. But everything is going good, man. Surviving the rains and just having a great time, you know? Yeah, it's the rainy season down there. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, it's the beginning of the hurricane. Yeah, it's the beginning of our hurricane season. So we have a little weather patterns passing through, you know? Okay. Well, uh, hope you stay safe down there, my man. And hope all is well. All right. So I believe that wraps everybody up this week. So Tyler from Family Tree Seeds. Yo, so, yo. Where do we, where should we even start? Um, like I said earlier, uh, the Pam Anderson's probably the most famous in your lineup. But like, just tell me about your lineup. Like, uh, where like where did it all start? Well, uh, <clears throat> so I've been growing like you know bag seed, Mexican bag, brickweed, you know bag seeds since I was like fourteen or fifteen years old. I used to trade little seedlings and little plants uh, for rides home. When I was like 15 and 16 years old, I'd go to the older kids and I'd be like, yo, uh, I'll give you a plan if you give me a ride home. I, I hung out, you know, quite a ways from where my home was. So I'd always kind of hustle that way, figure out, you know, I always had a couple in the backyard. And, and as I grew up and as I, you know, got older, I got more complex, just like everybody else. Um, I found a way to, to do my fruit. I've always done, you know, plants and trees and things like that so I did a lot of study and a lot of work in the nurseries and things like that uh, a lot of soil study a lot of a lot of stuff and growing cannabis the whole time uh, in like 2013 2014 uh, is when I got my my little plot my little my little area here in uh, North North County San Diego and that's when I dug out my little uh, uh, stash of seeds that I had since I was a little kid so, I would, you know, we'd moved all over and, you know, it's that classic story, you know, you, you, you lose this, these old seeds that are sitting around and one day you open up a box and you got this, you know, all this stuff you forgot you had. And uh, I didn't have very many uh, connections and things up here at that time. And I was, I was starting to have a family and all that stuff. So, man, I popped a bunch of those seeds or tried to pop a bunch of them and not a lot of them popped because they were really old. Uh, but out of that group, I got, I got one or two keeper plants to come out of there and uh one of them was pam's mother and uh you know that's the story of the pam basically i got this this plant came out of bag seed from late 90s early 2000s somewhere in that around 2000 probably 99 to 2003 something like that 2004 at the latest um and uh, no idea what it was i popped this seed out comes this awesome plant i wanted to keep it I had, wasn't prepared. I was, you know, doing a build, needed to set up my nursery here at the place, the whole deal. So I cut everything down except for the last 
couple branches on the bottom of the plant and I just left it to rot, hoping that it would herm out or, you know, I could get it to re-veg, make it through the winter because our winters are pretty mild here. I was going to try to protect it and see if I can get it to, you know, come back around. Didn't have any lights, didn't have anything set up at that time. So it did end up herming out, I believe, or got pollinated by some stray pollens in some place. But I ended up with, you know, 13, 14 seeds, something like that out of the, out of the batch. I popped uh, half of those seeds. I picked out Pam. She was the colorful purple one out of the group that looked most like mama and had more of the candy terps. And I started growing that for a while and I fell in love with that plant and I wanted to know what the hell it was, where the hell it came from, what it was connected to. I, I needed to know more information. So at that time, you know, it was like, I don't know, four years ago, three years ago, something like that. I sent a sample to Phylos before they went to, to dog shit and uh, to see if I could get a, a genetic family uh, lineage on her, any information on what, you know, where she came from, where, where her history was. And basically she came back with, no connected family in their in their database so they tested thousands of thousands of plants you know um trying to put together their galaxy and in that galaxy that they had put together the pam didn't fit you know with any one of those places so it doesn't mean that she's like this super special rare thing it just means that out of the thousands of plants that they tested she wasn't related to any of them so she is unique uh, she's not something that, that's in the regular gene pool, the cookies, the OGs, the, most things when you look at like do si -Do in the galaxy, you'll see 30 or 40 different plants like, you know, you know, Tahoe G's and all these different, you know, cookies and different things that are, you know, that are closely related to that plant. And Pam sits alone in the galaxy. Uh, so at that point, I didn't really get the answer that I wanted. So I figured oh, it was special enough to me. I was going to keep working with it and I was going to wait, you know, and see if, you know, cost effectiveness, more, more technology would come out. I would be able to figure it out, you know, eventually. And I've just been breeding with that plant ever since trying to, if she, if she is, you know, kind of out of the, out of the, out of the spectrum, just kind of re implementing her into the system or be making myself happy and other people happy because she is a, she is a nine out of a 10 uh, on the star star level. Um, the Pam, clones easy she's absolutely gorgeous if you look at my page you can see crazy pictures of the pam you know she gets pinks and purples and swirls of these gunmetal blues lots of candy grapes skunks musty wine terps coming out of her very unique very powerful uh, on uh you know in a vegetative state and in a bloom state uh she's been with me for a lot of years now and i'll never lose her um I did uh, open up those seeds again. I popped half of the original group, selected Pam. I popped another group and I got a male out of there, which made me think that it was a pollination and it wasn't her hermaphrodite, you know what I mean? Like I originally thought because I did pull a male out of there. So uh, I took that male, pollinated the Pam, made the F2, went through a bunch of those plants, picked out what I call Pam 15 and Pam 15 is an absolute superstar haze machine. Um, frost bucket, stretchy monster, one of the biggest, nastiest stretching plants, most obnoxious plants you've ever seen, you know, growing will put any, you know, su silver, you know, super silver haze to shame. Any, any of the plants you think stretch, the Pam 15 will outstretch that tenfold. It's, it's insane how, how, how insane she is. But her flower is such quality that it, it actually exceeds the Pam 1, in my opinion, on smokability and experience. Um, but in that, I've been making F3s, and we're on, to, we're on to F4 now. I've done some back crosses. I've done, you know, out crosses, uh, everything you can, you can name uh, with the Pam just to try to, you know, learn more about her. And along the way, at F3, I learned about her red stem trait, and that, that places her as, you know, in that, India, Pakistan uh, realm, uh, because at bloom, at the start of bloom, no, you know, it's not a nutritional deficiency. It's all at the start of bloom, those stems turn red. And that is a, that is an India trait. That is an India trait from traded to Pakistan. That's, you can get some Afghanis that way, but that is, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm pulling it down to at this point. Uh, and then you look at some of those, those plants that are coming through and you see that. So she's pretty darn close to a traditional land race 
Pam one is. I mean, she's not very far removed. She's maybe, you know, maybe bred one or two times uh, with something else to, to get her there, but she's, she's a straight up sativa monster. She'll get 12 feet, 15 feet easy here in SoCal. Uh, on average, you're at nine feet, no, no question. Uh, always the biggest, nastiest, prettiest girl in the, in the, That's, in the shed. Uh... I don't want to put that in my little two by two. Jeez, man. No, you'll be, blow, you'll be blowing that's the, the doors problem. off of it. <laughs> that's the problem, you know? So uh, that's why, that's why, uh, you know, a lot of the, the stuff that I choose to breed her, I try to shorten it up. You know, I go, I, I want to give her the, the dog walkers and more of the indica stuff, get, get a little gas into her, shorten up the, the, the frame, get it so that it, it, it's more controllable on a two by two or a four by four. I mean, you can do it. I do it. I mean, there's, you know, multiple ways to do it and you just got to be willing to, to deal with it. And her flower is definitely worth it. Uh, but yeah, when it, when it stretches 10 times more than anything you've ever grown, it's definitely going to, you know, send you for a, for a head spin if you're trying to grow yeah, it. Yeah, man. It's, it's like basically put it in the tent, flip at the flower and keep the light smashed yep. on top of it and hope yep. for the best. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Just keep it on 12, 12, you know, um, but yeah, that's, you know, and I, I'm, I'm a big medical guy. I like to do lots of CBD weaving and funny things. I don't want to dominate things, but I want to open up the cannabinoid baskets and things a lot more. So I, I, years ago, I've been diving into different two to ones and three to ones and funny different lines that, that have more of a broad basket of cannabinoids. And I've been trying to weave those in to these heavy hitters so that we get better, you know, better experience and, and longer carry a high and kind of get, get back to that, that old school stuff that people are always like, Oh man, we just isn't the same, you know? And it's because we've lost a lot of those cannabinoid basket, a lot of the cannabinoid basket, I think. That's interesting. I like, I like that. So you're talking about breeding CBD back into your stuff. So like how much CBD are you, are we talking about here? Like, so I would like my favorite, the, what I think, I'll give you a crazy ass theory, right? I think in a couple of years that one to one and even a THC dominant plant, like my favorite plants are always THC heavy with like three to 4% CBD on board. You got just a little extra on that CBD uh, on, on board. It doesn't quite hit you like a friggin' sludge hammer in the very beginning, but it, it definitely carries your high you know, to extremes, you get, you get a longer length of high, you get redu reduction of like any paranoias or anxieties. It's a much more pleasurable experience, in my opinion, uh, when you have just a smidge of some CBD or some CBG or a little bit more uh, of those things and you're not all THC dominant. So I've been working on plants, uh, trying to create plants that are like that, uh, like Hubble and uh, there's Martha Stewart. There's a couple of things that I've been working on for a lot of, a lot of years, trying to kind of get that profile in there. Uh, high THC, like somewhere 25, 26, 27, three, four percent CBD, and then you know some one or two. See, my you know my favorite plant would be like a three percent, three percent, three percent, three percent, three percent, three percent of everything. You know, if we could find a plant that had three percent of almost every cannabinoid in the basket, I think that would be the the most rad plant on planet Earth to have. You know, so I'm just I would trying definitely, to uh, explore that. Basket, that'd be you know hell. I mean? of, that'd be a hell of an experience, man. Yeah, yeah. That's the, those are the types of things that I'm thinking about, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I don't, man, I love, I love experience and I love, you know, I love all those heavy hitters, but I'm thinking that as we learn more about it, opening up the basket is going to be beneficial uh, to get more people on board and to really enhance those, those benefits. If you can get, you know, you get like a, a heavy indica for somebody who's on those opiates and things, that's what they want. They want those pushes and OGs sitting them down and actually filling those gaps if you get them you know a plant that has that plus a little bit of cbd and a little bit of those cbgs in there on, on a little bit bigger scale than they're used to you're going to get more medical benefit you know you're going to get uh, you know a better overall uh, medicine uh, in my opinion when you're when you're looking for that so those are the types of things that i look for and i kind of want to do and i've been playing with for a lot of years and then i got you know all those nasty things that we love, you know what I mean? So, uh, but that's, that's kind of my goal is to just kind of open up the basket without ruining the basket. If that makes sense. I like that. I'm sure Fumador's minds over there grinding away, man. This is, this is his <laughs> realm, man. Uh, I'm sure he's got something to say by now. 
Well, I, I actually agree with him. You know, like I've said this before, I actually gave Angelo, like I've been growing Angelo for a while now. It's uh, Calio by Pennywise. I gave her a good fair shot, man. It's a great plant. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not my cup of tea. That's all it is. Like speaking of tea, there's tea that you don't like. That plant is not for me, man. I, I just, I can't smoke it. When I smoke it, there's too much CBD. It's basically a one-to-one. So it's like, I haven't tested it, but let's call it 10 and 10, 10 and 9, whatever it is. But yeah. basically you feel the THC, but then right after that, you feel the THC and it brings you down. And for me anyway, it kind of makes me a little bit sleepy, a little bit like kind of, uh, which is fine. Again, for someone else who wants that, it's probably a really, really good medicinal effect. But for me, I really prefer something that has just a little bit of CBD, then I feel it. And the THC gets me moving, gets me doing other things and gets me relaxed. I think that's a much better approach. Yeah. My yeah, question is for Jeff. So I don't feel that same way due to the fact I smoke high concentrated dabs all day long. I can smoke indica all day long or sativa and it doesn't affect me the same, I don't think, as it used to when I didn't have a tolerance. Is that the same for you, Jeff? Where you can yeah, if I smoke during man. the day, it makes me tired. And if I smoke at night, it makes me unable to sleep, no matter what strain it is. <laughs> yeah, right for me too, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter the strain anymore. It's just, I'm just high. Some stuff does kind of, I don't know. I've got some, uh, some banana stuff. What was I smoking? Uh, bananas foster. It made me a little more, sometimes I notice it and it's gotta be an extreme swing in the medicine, but some will make me sit down and some make me unable to shut the fuck up. So, uh, but most of the time, uh, I've got to get really dabbed out to get to one of those points, but most of the time you're right. It's just, I'm just high at this point. Yeah. They've separated it so much in the concentrate. Something's weird. They just took out something. The flower does a different buzz. Yeah. I smoke, I mean, we're, you know, I'm, I'm terrible, man. I'll go through more flower than you would ever believe in a day. Uh, so like Sounds having, like a, have, having something, uh, you know, that has a little bit of CBD on there. I mean, that'll eliminate headaches and that helps, that helps in a lot of ways when you're, when you're going through a ton of flour, you know what I mean? And my, for me anyway, um, it does, but then again, I mean, nine out of the 10 things that I'm smoking doesn't have CBD in it. So um, it's, 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 it's finding the right plants. And only lately have I found the plants that I've been looking for, you know what I mean? In that realm with those ratios, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a good, it's a good thing. And it's an experience that, uh, that I wouldn't take back that. Huh? Yeah. What, what you smoking on over there, Bob? Uh, you know me, I like my blended. So the same, I have a Colombian mix with a cherry pie. So that's like going to be my base for the next month until it's out. And then I sprinkle a liquor. So right now I have something they call the blue frost. So it's like a blueberry with an OG. But it just, it's sleepy weed, man. That's sleepy weed, you know. <laughs> so I still have to mix a liquor, the Colombian cherry pie to flavor. So I like blems, you know, I like mixing yeah. it all up till I get what I want. Yeah. Bob's custom yeah. blends. Never the same. <laughs> hey man, you always keep you on your always keeps you on your toes. And that's why when I hear Family Tree speaking about mixing that original with the new stuff, I mean that's my life. Like I really like, <clears throat> as I said, retrovising the 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 top forty list. You know, so whatever old school pile and I can get my hands on and put it on the top forty, whether it's gelato or whatever. I just like it. I like the difference, you know. I haven't found one strain that I can say I can smoke this forever. It's hard. That's hard. There's not one that does everything, and that's why I want that 3%, 3%, 3%, 3%. You know what I mean? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's not. But I haven't found the one either, you know. There's a couple. And I don't have one. a problem. I'm enjoying the journey. I like the journey. Yeah. Maybe that is it. So I'm good. I'm happy. I'm, I'm not disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of with you on that, Bob. What what if the what if there never is supposed to be the perfect plant, and we're always just going to be, you know, constantly okay. going, constantly chasing the dragon, so to speak. Yeah, man, that sounds good to me. Yep. I think I've signed up for that one. Yeah, I mean, it always keeps you interested, right? You never know where it's going to end. Yeah, man. Man, people's people change. Weed changes. Like if you look at the Olympic athletes, speaking of uh, Jamaican Olympic runners now, they run so much faster than the winners from 1920, 1930, 1940. And those people were like the experts of their day. So it stands to reason that the weed of tomorrow will be something similar too. It'll be bigger, faster, stronger, better in every possible way. Hopefully, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, that that kind of is the the human thing to do, right? Is to try and improve things. Innovation, baby. I think also it's a balance because hence why you have the rise in CBD right now. A couple of years ago, nobody was really growing for CBD, but you have a market that's really onto it and they really like the balancing effect. And I am really happy for it. I would not normally go to it, but because it's available and you get to experience it, you say, hey, I can mix a little bit of this and that, and it actually works really well. Like, you know, pain relief, especially in the back and stuff like that. I find like some good CBD strains are really good where that's concerned. So you might not even realize it is like, man, this weed is not good. I'm not getting high, but then I'm super flexible. I can do stretches. And so, yep. yeah, hey, you know, it's some yoga weed. I don't know. but So I like it. I like it. Every, I don't I don't think Rasta and I will, we don't have any bad weed, you know, it's, if it's not badly grown, you know, it's, it might be inferior product, but the herb itself, all of it has very good value to somebody somewhere. You know? Well said. Well said. So, anybody else have any questions for Tyler? No? Well, so, guys are up. I was saying, as a grower, I mean, what is it that you think in terms of where you see the industry is going? Our space in the market, a lot of people see it as a growing space. Like, I think. A lot of small growers, especially like us grassroots, we really see the potential. I don't know if, see, like most industries, when we see big farmer or big people coming in, we kind of get scared. But I just think within this industry, it's so unique that we see more room to grow. So within that space, where do you see yourself fitting in in the market? Like, what do you think your ideal lane is would be? I think uh, I lay where it's, like the home the home cultivator you know uh people that want to grow big plants and good solid plants for themselves to take care of their family you know whether it be a medicinal plant whether it be a heavy hitter but i try to i want to i want to drive to more of the the home the home grower the the old schooler the the people who need the most help that need that need the the growing advice and knowledge so that they don't have to, you know, spend the money and, and get taken at the shops like they're like, they're, like you do. I, I think that if I can, you know, and that's what I've kind of done with my fruit tree stuff all this, all this time is I just nurture, nurture that need. And all of a sudden you find, you know, you teach, you teach a person to fish, man, it really, it really changes their world, you know? So uh, that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a, you know, I'll teach, I teach them how to grow it and I'll give the, the quality genetics that are going to do what they need to do. You know what I mean? Uh, like I said, opening the basket if they need it, if they need some, you know, bigger, stronger, durable disease resistance, things that are going to be easy to grow. You might be sick. You might be hurting uh, something that's not going to be a pain in the ass, but it's going to deliver. Uh, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. But a lot of my stuff, you're not going to want to grow commercially like that. The, the, the PAMs, the, the PAM 15s, they're going to be stretch machines. You know what I'm saying? They're not, you know, they're going to be, they're going to flower a little bit longer, you know, where also where I think quality lies is a longer flowering uh, plant. You know, you can get a plant to sit at nine, 11, you know, weeks, something like that in a flat. I mean, that's, that's where the experience comes in also, in my opinion. So I think that those people that are a little bit in need who want to grow something and be able to grow something, that's kind of where I fit. You know, um, I, I like. I like being able to teach people how to fish. I do it with fruit. I do it with cannabis, but I want, I want them to be able to catch the fish too. So I want to make plants that, that do the, that, that do the job. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, man, you are, you are among like-minded individuals. I think we're all here because we, we enjoy trying to teach others and like, especially, you know, Rasta Jeff, man, he's got his own podcast teaching and giving out bomb genetics too. So you, you're among like-minded individuals. Heck yeah, man. When you say embracing, yeah, in terms of embracing organics, you know, I think it's a, it should be an evolutionary process as in we all try to get better. You know, I think everybody wants a better piece of the pie, whatever it is. And what's the most recent evolution to your organic game that you think that's been going on? Um, lately, I've been doing a lot more like on-site 
um, nutrient creation, you know, a lot more KNF type inputs or a lot more recycling of what is on my land, trying to not buy anything. Uh, I have worm farms. I have, I've had chickens. I've had, you know, all different types of setups. We have compost piles. We have every type of situation you can imagine. Um, I'm always trying to harvest things. So doing, uh, like, you know, LABs and IMOs and uh, FPJs and other things like that. I've been making a lot more things on, along those lines. I find the best thing that I actually use that I find the most benefit out of is the calcium, is my WCA calcium. Um, everything else, I mean, I could really throw that, you know, it helps for those. But when I actually, you know, when you actually take the time to make the, the calcium, uh, that's, when, that's when you see the results. So um, I've been making brother, more of my inputs. That's, that's what I've been doing. Right there, because why I'm saying that, honestly, we had a, we had a conference. There's a big conference here in the Caribbean. We call it Canex. So we had a local cultivation panel. And we just introduced that WCA, that, you know, eggshells or, you know, because we're by the sea here, you know, bits of coral, some bits of shells. You can use, you know, a lot of sea culture. And... I don't want to say it, man, but it looks like it gets rid of almost any problem that you have along the way. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know if you could. <clears throat> and uh, what I really like about it, it's really super cheap to make. It's super cost efficient. Every single farmer needs to get to do it. So I don't know if you could just go into a quick breakdown and just step by step how to do it for any small farmer and then methods of application or, you know, if you could just go into that a bit more because I really think it's worth it. And if anybody includes it in their game, they will see the difference. Easy Absolutely. to apply, easy to use, and you will see results. So if you could go into it for a little bit more detail, I would greatly appreciate it. No, you got it. You got it. So uh, basically, um, save your eggshells. If you got chickens, great. If you don't, just save your eggshells. You know, if you eat eggs, eat eggs, you know, every day for a couple of days, you know. Uh, you don't need a ton. You can get, you know, say, you know, two dozen eggs. You can do it with less. You can do it with a dozen eggs. If you want to do something like that, you can do it on a very small scale. Basically, what you do is you take the eggshells, you smash them up to get rid of that little membrane that's on the inside. When you crack an egg, you have this little, in this little membrane that coats the inside of the eggshell. So by smashing it and by lightly cooking it on the stove in a skillet, you get a skillet, Smash your eggs inside that skillet, crush them as small as you can. As they cook, they'll crush, be able to crush easier and be, you know, able to crush more as time goes on. But the idea is every five minutes or so, you want to cook these things for about half an hour, somewhere along those lines, 20 to 40 minutes, depending on your stove, your situation. Uh, it's about all, all the time that it takes for me to get rid of most of that membrane. But basically, you take all of those eggs you saved, you throw them in a skillet. You crush them down, you put the skillet on low to medium high, and you just lightly, lightly cook those eggshells until they become golden, golden brown, very lightly, very lightly, you know, uh, touched by the flame. And then every five minutes oh, or so, I pick up that skillet and I blow out, I blow on it and it blows out all that, that membrane will fly away very, very easily. So you can kind of get that out of the pan. You don't want that. That makes your WCA dirty. So you basically every five minutes, you pick up the pan, you take it kind of outside if you can, or if it doesn't matter, just blow it where, you, where you're at, but you blow it, blow it off lightly, and you'll see all this dust flying off of the eggshells, and then you put it back down on, and you continue to cook that down until your eggshells can, can get very, very small, very small particle, dusty particle size as much as you can, and to get as much surface area uh, exposed as possible. And then once your eggshells, you, you're blowing on it and not a lot of debris coming off of them, and they're golden brown, takes about a half an hour, 40 minutes or so, then you can go ahead and you can add them to um, uh, vinegar. You can use rice vinegar. You can use apple cider vinegar, uh, just, it, just a vinegar. And basically it's, it's one to 10 ratio is the way I do it. One part eggshells to 10 parts vinegar. And as soon as you add the vinegar, you put the eggshells in, and you add the vinegar. As soon as you add the, the vinegar, it starts to bubble and simmer and go crazy, from like like you know, like a bad mamma jamma. Mm -hmm. And then you put put a little uh, put a little uh, paper towel or a towel over the top of it, and put it up in the dark, you know, someplace you know up up someplace dry and dark, 
and it's got to sit there for five, five to seven days uh, is usually all it takes. Uh, it might stop bubbling after two or three days, but usually about by day five, it stops bubbling and you can pull it out. And then what you do is you're left with a bunch of these eggshells and a bunch of this brown vinegar. That brown vinegar during that bubbling process has now turned those eggshells, took in that calcium and made it, turned it into a, uh, a plant available calcium, right? In plant available form. So you basically just take that liquid and strain it. You can just dump it in a strainer, get those eggshells, chuck it in the garden or wherever you're at, just to dis discard the eggshells. And then you keep that liquid. And that liquid, I usually, I usually keep a breathable lid on there. I usually keep a, a you know, a towel or, or a paper towel or something over the top of it instead of a regular hard lid. But that's that's preference and depends on what type of vinegar you use. Um, and then you use that, you mix that uh, one to a thousand is is the ratio that we mix that in so just a tiny 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 amount uh one part you know the wca to a thousand parts water however big your container is you don't have to be you know extremely precise but you want to do it about one to a thousand and doing a foliar feed on the plants you'll see you know instant results you can just dump it on the soil you can do all those things but it calcium is the mother of the soil and it will it'll loosen things up and make mm -hmm. make nutrients and minerals you know move. So you you know getting it, especially with fast growing plants, in an available form is is a lifesaver. Without like magnesium and all that other crap attached to it, just a good plant available calcium, that's a magic thing. You know, I wonder if magic. that's what kombucha is doing as well, because it has a very high pH of a acidic almost. Yeah. Or very tart like vinegar. Taste yeah, they're using stuff. that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. They're extracting those those nutrients and certain, you know, certain microbes and things live in those conditions. You know, right. but there's less microbial activity unless you're using like a living uh, apple cider vinegar with like a mother and stuff like that. I don't. I find that the rice vinegar is cheaper and works just as good. So you don't have to spend the extra if you you know if you don't want to. But if you use the the, the apple cider vinegar that's alive then always use a breathable lid, you know, with that. So that's the only tip that that's, I learned. It stays better longer. That's what maybe made the correlation. That's the same thing you do with your kombucha. You'd never seal that dude up. Yeah, exactly. That would explode, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you always just use like a cheesecloth or paper towel over top. Yep, yep, let it breathe. Speaking of which, man. Lot. What's this Nasi, story? bro, have you been remembering to open that bottle of uh, EM1 that I gave Sorry. you, the activated EM1? Bro, I knew it. I thought about it because when I went to open my, I need to go bottle, get it. I need to go get it. Out, it was like on its side and shit. I was like, oh fuck, and it goes. So like, I've had a couple of things. Kabucha, I've had to do that too. If I try to like save a ca scoby. So the other day, I go in my shelf, and I've had this tincture jar of THC been sitting in vegetable glycerin for about three, four years now, and I saw that it's now starting to like push itself out the fucking lid of the jar and it made a mess and everything but yeah, yeah remember to loosen up the lid on that bottle every now and then because i bet that thing is probably primed to explode right you now. got like a soda oh, bottle man. sitting in there shit dude i'll do that after the show <laughs> but after, out of all the stuff that i made i think that's the most beneficial and like most practically easy thing that anybody can just do you know yeah and that that sounds incredibly easy. I, like I'm sitting here listening to you go through it. And I'm like, man, I think I might go try that soon. I just got to yeah. save up the eggshells. Yeah, because anybody wants to eat, look it up. People eat breakfast all week long. They could easily save their eggshells. And... That's right. That's right. Or if you live by the ocean, as I said, any form of you know ocean coral stuff like that, you know. So I kind of we have a little bag or something, smash it with a hammer, and as I say, we toast it. Just toast it a little bit because you just want to get it toasty, kind of crispy, little much like yep. toast, you know, like you know, the, the croutons kind of crouton kind of style, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And when you get the heat on it, and I think the parameters is what I really like. I'm not a super great teacher, but it stops bubbling, that's when you put it. So, how to store it, like what's the storage on it, and the 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 dosage so those two points i think are really key you know so the parameters so as i said get the powder stuff off the eggshells you know so you know just put 
emphasizing parameters is really good. So you don't want this and you don't want that and anything in between can kind of work. Yep. You know? But the only thing I've seen with it over the years, especially for new people are people that are onto it, not really the overdoing of it, but I think that when you do it too much, you will have all your strains get almost a similar flavor profile. Like it gets a, a very same base. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying, trying to say. So now to bring back the natural flavor in it, it's good to tip up some sulfur or something like that. So I don't know. As I said, we might go way down the rabbit hole, but you know, I'm just trying to work with well, you here. The, so. the sulfur would lock up some of the calcium and that would that would kind of bring you back into the balance. So I'm just saying these are things that we have to kind of play with. So when you overdo it a lot with the calcium, I've seen that like you have 10 different strains and all of them will have the same basic kind of plastic, not really plastic, but it just has a, you know, a solid different note. But if you know what you're doing, do you find that problem? And if you do, or what do you do to kind of bring up the flavor profile or the terpene enhancement, especially in the last, you know, three to four weeks? Yeah, they've, they've done they've done lots of studies where, you know, like different inputs makes the weed taste a certain way or smell a certain way, you know, like back guanos or grape husks and all these different types of inputs, you know, fish, kelps, you know, there's things that you can taste in the end, like we are what we eat, you know, our plants are what they eat, you know, it's the same type of principle. So uh, it's, it, you know, it changing it up is really important but the calcium use it all in everybody they're all going to have the response they're all going to have the same type of thing and then you know they're all gonna they might all respond similarly to to the application so bouncing around sulfur always adds flavor sulfur always adds flavor you can get a little bit of sulfur in there that 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 really i mean i've done trials where there's stuff called like FST and stuff that we use for fruit trees. It's got a lot of sulfur and other minerals and things in it. And giving a little bit of this to, to test actually does change turf profiles pretty, pretty substantially. Now, I don't want to use any of the products, you know, that FSTs touch, but just seeing how drastically the turf profiles change by giving it different things was really kind of, kind of neat. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just balanced, man. You got to, I think what I really just want to highlight is that less is more. Even though the calcium is super great, it's kind of one of those less is more things. You know, just be careful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're not. We're we got to remember we we don't drive. The plant drives. You know what I mean? We're we're just we're just on board. You know, and as soon as we start trying thinking that we know something better than it knows, then that's when all the problems start, man. So, you and know, that's why we, I like to not encourage driving. people to do like a dry farm, like have a pot that you just don't treat very well and really do a comparison and see how much yeah, yeah. you can save yourself, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. You know, got to, you know, you got to. So. Well, we've had uh, Clack and Scoot on the show a bunch lately. I guess I've had him on my show too. And he's kind of the poster child of like simplicity in the garden. He has one plant he takes care of. He has this very simple, basically water only mix. Uh, I guess where I'm going with that is, is there a, you see this kind of with fruit trees and everything else, is there a perpetual problem of kind of over mothering with, uh, with growing? Because for example, like I say, over here, kud is just simple, pour water on it, it'll freaking grow. And then over here, you can dose this and this and this, and you can do that with organics and synthetics both, right? So is that like, like uh, I don't know, is that a super common thing that you see? Just that over? Yeah. So, and especially like, you know, people want, want their stuff to happen quick, especially cannabis. You're going to over mother, mother things with cannabis or even your fruit trees. You want it to harvest. So you're with people that got the time. They're always trying to give it. What can I give it? I got a client that's like, Hey, I want to give it more fertilizer or I want to give it more minerals. I want to give it more. And it's like, man, you, you don't need to do any of that. You're, you're good. You know, you just, you just got to wait, you know, <laughs> like they got their trees. They take You just time, need to give you know it more time. That's all you need. Exactly. Exactly. So, what isn't that with everything? Fruit. What was that? That's with everything. That's with everything. That's right. No <laughs> joke. No joke. But I mean, they've done studies where it's like when you put too much inputs into these trees, or you put too many things in there, the sugars and the starches inside the plants are an attractant to problems. You know what I mean? By us trying to overmother, we're actually creating the problems that that we're trying to to deal with. You know what I mean? And it's like. It's an ammonical nitrogen thing. It's a nitrate nitrogen balance. It's 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 a bunch of different things that are that are in in the plants at a certain level in the sap. And when they do sap analysis on things, the ones that are 
infected are the ones that are overdriven, you know? So by us getting out of the friggin' way and just providing, providing a good road for them to drive on, you know, instead of trying to drive the car, there's the way to do it for sure. Like no question about it. Otherwise you're going to be battling. You're going to be battling your whole life. You know, and like one thing I always tell people too, it's like one thing that's most overlooked, especially in outdoor gardening and especially with fruit tree cultivation is the temperature of the surface soil. So if your soil is uncovered and you look down and you see that there's just dirt on the ground, if you look and look down and actually see something that looks like dirt on the ground, your soil is sick. It has a fever. And I can shoot that with a thermometer all day, right on the ocean on a 70 degree day at 10 in the morning. And that soil will be 130, 140 degrees on the surface of the soil right there, if it's uncovered. And when that temperature exceeds that 85 degree mark, plants go into hold mode and they stop drinking water. There's no organisms, there's no fungi, there's no things there that want to live in those temperatures because everything on earth has, wants to live at 60 to 85. That's like earth temp. That's like the perfect temperature, 60 to 85. If you go to any forest system, you can go to your forest, wherever you go, you can move the forest duff that covers the ground, that's the insulation, and you shoot that soil, it will always be between 60 and 85 degrees regulated, no matter what time of year, no matter how hot or cold it is out there, your soil temperature is regulated at that temperature. So when it's uncovered and it fluctuates from 60 to 160 to all in between, none of your organisms live there. None of your root systems are, are actually functioning and your tree is just trying not to die. So nine times out of 10, I get to a place where, where a tree is sick and it's simple. They're, they're cleaning the ground underneath of their plants. And during the heat of the day, it's heating up, killing the organisms that are supposed to feed and protect them and putting the tree in a, in a position where it can't drink water. So when you apply those principles to cannabis and outdoor growing, you would be amazed at the, at the reduction in insect and pathogen pressure and all these things because you go into the control center and you turn off all those stress beacons. You literally go in there and turn off all the little sirens that are, that are, that are sounding because the temperatures are at a regulated temperature in, in life land. Everybody wants to live there because there's cover, there's food, there's consistent moisture, temperature, all that stuff that's when things can work 100% of the time and you don't have nearly the problems that you would. And when you do encounter problems, you can solve them and fix them quicker than anything because you have a solid base. You have a good rhizosphere, a good gut bacteria or whatever you want to look at it. It's a good balanced environment. So that's constantly what I'm doing and teaching and traveling around is like just soil temperature. So if you get one thing from it, it's just if the ground's uncovered, you're going to have problems. I can definitely, uh, I can definitely add to that. So I've been gardening with my grandparents. I've been gardening with my parents my whole life. You know, it, it's a, it's a family thing. We, we always done it together. My parents have always had this nice little garden on the side of their house. When I went and bought my own house, I went and put a garden on my house, you know, very similar, actually a little bit bigger than theirs. I kind of wanted to outdo them. And my dad's like, yeah, I'll bring the tiller over. We're going to, you know, we'll chop it all up, this, that, the other. I was like, no, 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 no. You stop right there. I was like, no, no, we're going no till. And he's like, you're doing what? And like, I was like, no fertilizers, no, none of that. I was like, we're doing no till. I was like, we're going and getting like four truckloads of wood chips and we're putting that on the ground. Then we're planting into that. And he's like, what's that going to do? I was like, just, just wait and see. And this year, <clears throat> I'm not even exaggerating. The leaves of my spaghetti squash are like 14, maybe 18 inches wide. Like they're ridiculously big. And my parents came over and they're like, how are you growing plants so big? I was like, because I'm not screwing with what's in the ground. Yep. 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 You go anywhere on earth and you, you look at where plants grow and where, where we are not. Like if, if plants are growing there and humans aren't there, the Amazon, the redwoods, wherever, where plants are growing, we're not you'll never see clean ground ever. The only place you see clean ground is in deserts, Mojave Desert, the uh, Australian Outback, the riverbeds, places where plants aren't growing. Are you trying is, to say that we are the problem? We are the problem. <laughs> <laughs> for real, for real. So, I mean, that's that's basically, that's that's what, you know, that's, it's so simple, it's funny, but it's the truth, you know? It's a, it's a silly thing that fixes a lot of problems. And then once you fix that problem, like I said, you can solve anything that pops up because you're, 
you already got a good base to pull from, you know? Come on, and even look at it like our body. When you, the first time you get sick, the first thing you do, you don't want to eat, you don't want to this, but this is your body saying, hey, I don't need anything in my stomach right now. We have to focus on getting this thing fixed. You know, so, and I was looking at a study the other day. I really am so bad at not quoting where it's from and all this, but they had some people that were sick and they get like five of them were on fruits, five of them were on antibiotics and like five of them on just like water only. And only the ones that were on water only, all of them recovered faster, came back quicker, you know. So I'm just saying it's clearly, it's in line yeah. with what you're saying, parallel, you know. Yeah. Yep. So... Also, I wanted to ask uh, Rasta, uh, Rasta Jeff, if he if he does any if, if, what what his thoughts on resin mails are because that's my that's my gig. If I'm using a mail, I'm gonna find a resin mail nine times out of ten. Yeah, if he's got trichomes, that's them. a dude. If he's got trichomes, huh? he gets to play. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, Some and if the stem smells like puke, oh no, I want trichomes. Why wouldn't oh, you? Yeah, good. you're trying. Yeah. I think of it like making it's like making a pie, and if I got trichomes in two different ingredients, I'm gonna get trichomes in the outcome for sure. Yep. Yep. Like, yep. Yeah. If there's trichomes in the batter, that cake should have that. fucking... Yeah. <laughs> Cheers to that, man. Totally. That's, yeah. totally. Yeah, some people are freaked out by the resin studs, so I always ask people who actually do that, you know, looking at mails and stuff, what they think or what they're doing, because, man, I'm I'm a resin mail searcher, man. I, I will go through thousands of plants to find that one dude who's got resin, and that's my that's my guy, you know, every you know, over anything, every time. Yeah, you know, puke so. scented trash can sort of smells yep. and trichomes and maybe a little bit of purple. That, that guy gets to play. Yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah, yep. That's it, man. So that's what, that's basically what's crossed to the Pam. All kinds of resin mails. There's all kinds of funny things. That's all my lines are built on resin mails and um, you know weird things like that. So um, that's kind of where I sit. It's pretty cool. I like hearing the fact that like none of your stuff is really like oh it's got this cross to this and you know you got you know eight different names in your lineage it's just yeah it's just some pam that i found out of some bag seed like i, I really like the fact that you are off the beaten trip off the beaten trail totally man uh, i mean man it's not to say that i don't have things that are you know crossed 15 times i've got some stuff that's at you know f8 f9 i've got several you know back crosses bx4 bx5s different things like that that i've been playing with but yeah man i don't like playing with all the same stuff that everybody plays with i mean it costs me uh, a little bit because you know i don't have any cakes and honeys and cookies and stuff in my names and i'm not you know i'm not playing with those strains that everybody's looking for but if you actually look yeah you see some of the stuff right here if you actually look at some of that stuff it's, it's yeah it's, world, it's a beautiful you know, plant things where it's an absolutely beautiful plant. it's quality it's photographic i mean there's things on there that it's just undeniable so you you see it you touch it you're you're sold but it ain't a cookie or a you know a blueberry or anything funny it's definitely off the beaten path speaking of cookies maybe they should have hired you a few years ago because you it, it seems like you're breeding through the female line as opposed to breeding through the male line right like most breeders i don't know jinx or jeff or anybody else they have one or two males they work with at a given time and they move on to another one exotic mike he has a couple different males every couple of months and huge old menu that comes out with all different kinds of females. And you're actually doing almost completely the opposite. You're, you're picking different males every time, kind of working with Pam almost every single time, uh, trying yep. to what, I guess, nail in Pam more. It's an interesting, it's a fresh perspective. Yeah. I like, I mean, I do, I do it both ways, but yeah, I like working with, you know, because, because she's just weird. And when you look at her and, you 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 smell her you see her grow you know that she's kind of she's just something a little different you know so like i've i just wanted to work with her because i wanted to make sure that if she wasn't if she wasn't out there in the world and she really was as special as as i thought she was that i needed to make sure that she you know she had as many different you know rolls of the dice as possible you know what i mean so um i, I i'm too excited I, I like keeping i keep a couple of males here or there one or two of my special guys will stick around as long as i can keep them but I like finding new males and I like looking for resin males. So anytime I can kind of make a line with Pam and then go through that, you know, that F2 or that F3 and search for a good resin male out of that group, like that gets me excited. And then I can kind of take it back, take it back to one of the, to the plants that I've already been playing with over and over again in different ways. So I want to make, I want to make them more the same. You're, you're going to get consistent results 
with every seed that you pop as opposed to, you know, just rolling the dice every time with something and just trying to, you know, get as many phenol, phenol hunters out there as I can. I really want more stability in my lines. So I try to work them a little bit. How old is this artichoke? Uh, that actually was one year from seed. Whoa. Believe it or not, no bullshit. So you must uh, have a very nice winter. Yeah, no, yeah, there is no winter, man. <laughs> <laughs> like it almost is. nothing. I mean, we got 30, we got 30, 38 degrees, 36 degrees, maybe for just a few days here or there. And then we're, we're most of the time in the 40s and stuff in the winter, 50s in the winter. Um, but yeah, I, I always let my artichokes, a bunch of them go to seed. And I got a big orchard plot where we got like, you know, 100 fruit trees out in the back there. And every year I just got wild artichokes and I'm always cutting down and letting go. That one's actually a, a screen blocker that blocks a bunch of cannabis and a hoop from, the, from the side. It's like a seven foot beast that, that really served a purpose, you know? So I was happy I about that. It. I like artichokes. Yeah, man. Yeah. We grow everything, man. You know, there's apples on the ocean right there. And people don't think you can grow apples on the ocean. We grow That's apples a beautiful ocean, picture, but, man. You know? So, yeah. That's uh, that's La Jolla. That's a good mansion there in La Jolla. Yeah. Have you ever watched the documentary Botany of Desire? I have not. I've heard oh, of it. Like I have this not. one, bro, it talks about how we become slaves to the plants to get them to where they are today. The apple tree, the yep. marijuana, and the tulip. Damn, and those that's are it. the very huge details, especially the apple tree. How, like, especially if you're going to make apple ciders, you have to have a very special one. It can't be too sour yep. or sweet. And it had to be like a certain one. And there's a bunch of like how you breed apple trees. There's a very deep. I never, I didn't know. I knew there was something like that with the tulips and the marijuana, but I never knew that with the apple trees. So oh, yeah, started. man. So we grow a lot of like, uh, like blueberries and pluots and nectoplums and all these hybrid fruits that are bred by pollen. And I've actually done some of those breedings myself where you get, you know, you get pollen from like a nectarine, you get pollen from a plum. The related trees in, in the same family you get some pollen going on a little little dance happens you plant the seeds after the fruits eaten and that contains that genetic material and if you go through a bunch of those you can find little winners that have characteristics of both parents or three parents or four parents i've got a pacotum it's a peach apricot and plum all rolled into one there's a bunch of different you know hybrids that, that we've been growing but yeah man breeding stuff and playing with those things apple trees the same way uh, ghost apples a new one that just came out we're playing with that that bad boy that's a that's a straight white apple that they bred you know at dave wilson uh but yeah man it's a it's a crazy world to get in i could talk for hours on freaking fruit tree varieties and you know characteristics and it's things that's my thing. life man it's almost like the same thing like ganja because i'm i'm glad to hear you speak about it because i guess because my involvement with plants it's mostly to ganja as a love as a passion so you know you play with it breeding you know from your kid you learn to breed and i think what they call it air layering or whatever they call yeah. it yeah you can do the same thing with ganja quite easily so even when i started out younger mango trees in jamaica we have a lot but some of the hybrid mangoes they don't really do so well in certain parts of the island but what you do we get like a traditional root stock or a hard stock like a blacky mango that's a traditional jamaican mango and then you can put other different mangoes on that tree. So I can have like five different varieties of mango yep. out my one tree. But it's the same thing I used to do with ganja. So a lot of the strains that came down, they used to only go this big because I guess now what I understand is that their trigger is much easier. So you get a lot of these Afghanistan genetics. I have to have like a thousand seeds to have, you know, even two pounds just because they're going to go short. They're not going to, because of my time frame when I plant it, the trigger happens quickly. However, when I put a clone of that now, I splice it onto a Jamaican lamb's bread. I can have like four or five different trees growing on the lamb's bread, you know. So I find that much easier. And I guess now in the ganja world, people are saying that, you know, it's kind of so, so somebody like Dan. That's what I would expect somebody to be doing naturally, you know. Instead of you just find one rootstock tree that grows well and you just put a couple different slits on it so you always have like a variety going on the yep. world. no that's funny you say it's funny you say that like i've actually been working on grafting cannabis like you know because of the fruit tree the game right so you get the pam is a great rootstock because she's a, she roots in eight days right she's she's like eight nine days you've got roots on her when when she wants to clone 
she's a friggin' grown, you know, like a friggin' badass sativa. It's a, it's the perfect rootstock, you know, just like you're saying, right? So I've been trying this season to do uh, different grafts on her to try to get three or four different varieties. Get the dog walker, get the get you know, get a cookie, get a funny thing on her frame. That way, each branch is a different type of of cannabis like we do with the fruit trees you know what i mean but that's that's exactly it you know we go through fruit trees like we, we graft things we we add you know multiple trees on one stock um depending on the type of soil conditions there are certain root stocks that we choose and that have different resistances and things like that but man it's that's something i think is going to you're going to see people grafting cannabis just like that fruit tree world you know what i mean well, I thought, and that's sales not good, you know you know, might be me, you know, you never know, so. <laughs> yeah, but it's a <laughs> natural here. progression. I thought I would say a lot more of that, but this is something like we do from high school, but it was only because it's the only way I could see what the American genetic or a Dutch genetic would kind of look like, you know, without having a lollipop tree, you know, a small yeah. representative. Yeah. You know, and it happens yeah. really easily once you have that root stock. It's, it's kind of hard to do on other plan, but once you have a super good root stock, yeah, man super easy yeah. like you, you, you'd be surprised how easy it will happen you know yep yep you get some of those and especially the right environment like fruit trees are easy i mean grafting that stuff you get a good vigorous thing you can you can really go to town you know and those annual type plants like cannabis and things they they're harder to do that with but it's totally possible and fun to do you know but i don't know if any of you guys remember but there was a, a guy that was on this show <laughs> early on he went by uh cannabis organum and he was actually like really, really into doing the cannabis grafting. I think he had like, God, I want to say like twelve different strains on like one plant in nice. a two by in a two by four tent, like something as big as what you're looking at here. So yeah, dude, it was yeah, that's cool, man. No, that's on, that's Dan, funny stuff. People are gonna we're gonna give with. you a challenge, Dan. Oh, you have the boy. environment, you have everything. <laughs> you're gonna get some Pam, I'm sure. You know, you have no problem getting a good root stock so you're gonna get some palm you're gonna so come on then we're gonna see we need to see this you want to see if i can if i can wrangle her yeah that'd be a hell of a thing for your channel man master come on then you stretch some stuff out you're gonna have like 50 20 different toppings on that come on now hey man i'm not i'm not scared of a good challenge sure i'll take it on Yeah. yeah in the fruit tree world i try to discourage people from having multi graphs because it's like four different trees on one plant and if you're just a homeowner who doesn't really care like and doesn't isn't passionate about caring for it one of those trees will always be the big bird and it will dominate the other four trees out of existence you know so you'll have this funky looking tree that just you know so if you're willing to take care of it and you're willing to do it you know i'll i'll, I'll let it happen and we'll, we'll plant some multi-graphs but if you can plant single trees i think that i do it you know what i mean on like a on an ease standpoint but man if you got passion and you want to play around there's some radical stuff you can do man with with the trees that it, it's fun you know, that's what keeps me going man there's always something fun that we can do you know stealing yeah. something from somewhere bringing it here and playing with this figuring out if the chilla will, will take it if they'll you know take the summer it's just fun man it's just fun so i mean are you, you're you guys ever had a blueberry I'm saying you're totally right because, for example, what normally happens is that the root stock. So, for example, I take a clone. So, I have a clone of a root stock. Then I put my clone of a cookie on top of it. All you have to do really is ensure that you always trim away the root stock growing. And then yep. the clone will be the only thing really on the plant. But if you're not careful, you think, oh, yeah, man, I have a nice orange gasm growing here. And then you end up with a big lamb's bread. You know, so yep. that's about it. Yep. So. Gotta watch that sucker. <laughs> it's strong for a reason. It'll want to take over, you know, unless you're watching. Yeah. For sure. So but you guys ever had any fruits like that? Blueberries, nectar plums, uh any other hybrid fruits like that, you know? Yeah man, yeah man. We'll play around good, good. after all them. Yeah man. Definitely. Good, 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 good. Jamaican good. apples and cross them. Like the black apple is what's real popular now. So we have an Ethiopian apple. So it, they're trying to breed it to look like a black American apple now, you know. So nice. A little less seed, because our seeds are fairly big, a lot less gotcha. flesh. But I like, mm -hmm. you know, the flesh is good. So I guess they're trying to do a smaller seed with more flesh. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when they do that, they water it down, man. It takes time. You got to figure it out, you know. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's meant to be that way. It sucks, you know. It's like the low quad. It's like 
I always call that God's cruel joke. It's a delicious fruit, but it's all seed. There's no, there's no, hardly no meat to it at all. It's, but it's absolutely delicious if you get good ones, you know. So it's well, funny. Honestly, what what we find now is that the flesh is good to eat right away, but if you find a way to eat, consume the seeds itself, that's almost like you're eating a whole tree. Yeah. Uh, so even like the ganja seeds itself, things like that, you know, it's a very good nutritious thing. You know, use it to make your flour. You know, make dumplings in our soup or when you're cooking. You know, so it's something that you consume right through. So any one of the fruits that you find that you might like, see if the seeds are. So like even watermelon seeds, pumpkin seeds, a lot of these things. That is the meal itself that you need to be consuming. You understand? To really get the vibe. Yeah. of orange gasm for a proper meal. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Tyler, you'd probably know about this then, since you're really into fruit trees. Have you ever had pawpaws? Yeah. So pawpaws are like one of the one things that don't grow well here. They don't tolerate the, the 30 degrees. They don't like that. The Hawaiian, like papayas, the pawpaws, the, uh, a couple of like the, the mangosteens, things like that. They're just a little too tropical, a little bit, a little bit harder to grow here. It's kind of so, interesting though, because here in PA, we actually have a PA golden pawpaw. Yep. It's, it's natural in this area it's wild i've never yep. heard of them and i see them all over the place and i was always like what are these things and i finally looked it up one day come to find yeah. out it's fruit that nobody's eating yeah it's, it, they're you know it, it's a it's a cultural delicacy certain cultures really you know admire them. a lot of asian cultures like the pawpaw fruits and things they're really close to like uh cherimoyas atomoyas things like that and like the you know like like he was saying with the seeds like most of the seeds we are supposed we're supposed to consume, but there's a few things like the cherimoya seeds. They're 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 toxic as all hell. So I don't know if the pawpaws fall into that because I think they're in the in the same group or in a, you know a similar a similar fruit. So they have those big black um, things. So um, but yeah, some seeds like the cherimoya are extremely extremely toxic. But pawpaws are like the one that and mangosteens. Those are the one things that we can't get fresh right here uh, that I can't get to to beat the the weather you know okay so, they have, you're, you're the first you're the good. first person i've got to talk to about that actually knew more the more about them than i do yeah there's some there's some weird like you you know over on the east coast they're mostly on the east coast they're mostly uh you know in that type of climate and things um you don't see a lot of that over here at all they're like one of those weird things that they like that that you know pennsylvania that that ohio that belt over there yeah because it, it, yeah. the, the humidity never really dips below like 40 around here like and gotcha. then it'll, it'll go way up in the 80s in the summertime yeah yeah but here the ones that you know it's a cold they don't like our cold but you get you get freezing temperatures so yours are a native variety that probably aren't as tasty um and will tolerate the cold you know what i mean yeah. aren't, aren't those tropical like you know vietnamese cultivars and stuff like that so but you know, we don't get them here. So it's the one thing I don't get. I get everything else on the, on the, you know, everything. <laughs> lucked, out with it, lucked out with everything else. You know, so we got, you know, uh, I just actually, we got a lot of mangoes coming on this year. This is finally, you know, year five, year six of the youngsters finally growing up and putting on, you know, mangoes. We got Alfonso's and ice creams and uh, coconut creams, funny things like that. Um, you know, I'm trying to make as many cuttings and do as many propagation things as I can with a bunch of these mangoes because they're hard to get, hard to come by around here. So um, I'm, I'm <laughs> Look at Bob over there. The yeah. <laughs> Lucky mango guy, crazy. man. He's, he's always got something, something fresh and something amazing looking over there. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. Hell, yeah. There's some head sizers. That's a comparison of a mango and a coconut, you know? Yep, that's beautiful, man. Oh, that's beautiful. What is that? A, what what kind of mango is that? Is that a key can? What kind of man? Where, where where are you at? Uh, this one, I really have to look it up. But all of these, we just call them hybrid mangoes. You know, gotcha. really, we just you know, they, they, obviously they have a name, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It, man, it's, I can't. Yeah, they come so regularly. There's four thousand of them. <laughs> well, it's, it's just like me and ganja, like really and truly. I miss the days when you just had high grade and it wasn't high grade like right now there's too much names too much distinction too much no yo give me is it high grade 
Is it the fire? Yeah, let me get the fire. And <laughs> when you have two options, it's like, can I have the, the fire or let me just get the mid, you know? Just cut right the bullshit. Now, have, <laughs> the top shelf has like so many varieties and then like, oh man, this is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's fun, it's fun. No, that's so, cool. I actually had a question for you. Um, Bob here, he's, he's really into outdoor growing. And I know it's for our viewers, it's a little late in the season to be like kind of promoting outdoor stuff, but maybe for like, you know, if you're looking for next year. Um, I saw on your website or not your website on your Instagram that you you do a lot of your growing outdoors. So like your plants are very hardy outdoors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I do. I, I, I do testing on both fronts. Um, if you get released, you have to you have to perform in both places. Uh, but like things like the Pam, you know, I'll give you a disclaimer and let you know kind of what's happening, what to expect. It's very important to me to have info when you're dealing with stuff. If you're going to be because most people are going to want to grow it inside. Nobody has perfect weather, you know, like we do here most most places. So I try to make sure that my plants are badass outdoor. And when they perform outdoor against the elements, against the bugs, against the temperatures, against you know, fluctuations, you know, 100 degree temperatures, all those things. Then at, you know, late June, I start taking clones of everybody. They come inside, get distributed amongst the, you know, the friends, the family, the testers. Those guys can run those inside. These ones are the ones that performed outside. Match up that data with the ones that are performing inside. Those are my keeper plants that we work with for the, for the breeding project, you know, so they, they should perform in both places very, very well. But because they are, first and foremost, all my seeds are, are, are grown in the ground. So, like, I make I put all my seeds, if, you're gonna, if I'm going to make a cross, that plant's actually sitting in the ground plugged into the earth. Uh, it's got all, everything at its disposal, the way that it wants, the, the sun and the stars, the moon, the whole, the whole shebang, right? Um, that, that's where it starts. So they're already pre-programmed with the information needed to survive and be strong outside. Uh, but like I said, everybody's trying to grow inside. You need to have those things. So we, we go through the extra steps and playing and figuring out which ones do best here, which ones do best there. And if you're too good and you only perform outside or you're too good and you, you want a herm inside or, or vice versa, then, you know, it's, you know, we, we either weed that out or there's heavy information and disclaimers on that. But, um, outside first and foremost plugged into the ground awesome i like that so that's one different thing i don't yeah i make seeds in pots as testers and funny little things for myself but if i'm making a batch of seeds and i need them to be the way that i want them to be i want them to you know um be in the ground plugged in that's that's my style so and that's cool. like the regenerative seed bank that's that's their whole you know gimmick and game and kind of their niche where they sit, you know, and that's Josh's good friend of mine. And, and those guys, they, they run that regenerative thing. And most of those types of um, people that are on there do those types of practices and things. So it's like, you know, it's just a little, little different thing, you know, um, you know, based on where you're at, what you can do, what you like, you know, I prefer outdoor pot, uh, good outdoor friggin' grown full sun in my area grown by me, better than any indoor stuff that I can, I can shake a stick at. Um, if I can protect that and make sure that it can finish outdoors, got such a better complexity, such a better, you know, full feeling in my opinion, I, I really love that outdoor, good outdoor done right. You know, but most of the time people are spraying it for an BT and they're freaking doing all kinds of crazy stuff, over driving the plants, getting power in the middle, doing stuff like that. But if you can, you can be methodical and actually pull off a clean outdoor crop with good with good genetics. I'll put it up against anything. I really will. You know, I'll slide it in an indoor competition where I'm at. I'm in the perfect distance from the from the ocean to the inland, so I have this perfect little situation right where I live. It's avocado country and fruit tree country, so there's all the agriculture's around, and they put it here for a reason because the weather is absolutely just perfect for growing things. You know, so. The cannabis that, that comes out of this area, this, this whole area is, I mean, it can, it can rival some of the best places in the world. Uh, and it's proven because that's, this is where we grow a lot of our fruits, like avocados and things like that, that, that supply a lot of the places, you know? So there's these little nooks and crannies. And if you're just the right distance from the coast and, you know, right distance in that, in that right little zone, your flowers develop in such a way that it looks like indoor 
and has those those complexities you know what i mean that, that you just can't get anywhere else you know so that's i like i like the outdoor stuff but i love growing a good thing indoor and having that and playing around and doing that too but i think that you know we got to start outside with the with the with with the with the tough plants because if they're not tough nobody's gonna freaking grow them or they're gonna have problems growing them you're gonna be all online bitching about what's happening and having a hard time you know what i mean i want to be i want to be able to plant a freaking seed and be able to freaking make every mistake in the book and still have that thing come come roaring at you, you know? So if you can do that, you're gonna make most people happy, you know, in my opinion. That sounds like a hell of a game plan. Yeah. EC Gorilla asks a simple one. Is there a way to contain the pollen outdoors? Yeah, you gotta build little uh, outdoor chambers. So either A, be really friggin' careful. You go out at night you wet down all the plants in the surrounding area very, very well because water kills pollen. Uh, it's an extra little, you know, barrier that you can kind of knock down just to be careful. It's not 100%, but shit, if everything's wet around you, chances are low. Uh, if you have no chamber, be careful. Go at night when there's no wind, no action. Uh, try to be thoughtful. And if you're going to make seeds and be playing with pollen, put your plants in a low windy area. Put them in a place that, you know, is is going to be suitable to kind of maybe contain that pollen in a little corridor or some sort of a little situation ahead of time. But if you're not, go out at night, soak the friggin' area down, go out with your little paintbrush and your collected pollen, and you can do a little hand pollination and be careful like that and make sure that everything stays, you know, stays, stays wet and cool. You get away with murder that way can also cause problems that way uh and i wouldn't recommend doing that if you're trying to like sell seeds or or do anything and tell people exactly what they are because it's you there's too many open variables at that point uh but if you're gonna do it outside during pollination what we do is we set up chambers like for little greenhouse chambers plastic the whole shebang and the pollination plants and the seed plants are all in little chambers and then i can soak down the chambers i can soak down the outside of the chambers and i can keep everything contained and sealed and you don't need to have pollen in a mail around the whole season you just need it for a day or two uh and you know a few minutes even in certain cases and all you got to do is make sure that that stuff goes away so contain it in some sort of a chamber little little gangster pvc uh greenhouse you know plastic chamber if that's if that's the way you go or if you have a dedicated greenhouse which is nice you know and you know you can build one there you go you got your you got your your seed greenhouse or your little thing you can roll off the top you want to do it like me you can roll off the top and get some full sun and then when flower comes on you can throw some you know mosquito netting or your plastic back up to to do some protective things but it's harder to do it outside but if you are methodical and you're thoughtful it's totally doable totally fine and you should do it you know so play around just don't have a male out in your backyard blowing pollen so it's screwing over everybody around you i mean that's that's a real bonehead move you know what i mean so if you're gonna grow males grow them in a contained bro situation. that male is the sickest man it's the it's the sickness it, it, it makes everything else like 10 feet taller man yeah yeah Let's that's see. right yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um, but no i find that you know I, having them in the ground i can get them to i can get nice fat nasty looking seeds outside in the sun strong protected pretty badass uh i like them that way you know so there's, you just got to be more methodical you just got to be more thoughtful and you know more present so make sure you you know it's harder harder to you know roll the dice outside sometimes that's awesome so i've seen uh dave's been uh patiently waiting over there hi dave Thanks for joining us this week, buddy. How are things going? Good, good. Thanks for letting me join in late, like I always do. Sorry, to, didn't want to interrupt. No, it's all good. Nice to meet you, brother. Yeah, yeah. Put your early for next week's show. I'm always. <laughs> it's, like, it's exactly how it works. I'm like, you know, an hour early for next week's show every time. Uh, no, it's been good. Uh, I had a good trip to Texas this last weekend, and glad to be home. And yeah, I don't want to interrupt, so please continue. Cool. Thanks, man. So, oh, geez, where do we go from here, man? 
you how about the soil you know i'm actually curious about something because you're um a tree consultant more than anything else we were talking earlier about fruit trees and, and you know about blue and it was a really interesting story i i think everybody here eats blueberries and walnuts and everything else it's wonderful that someone knows how to grow trees famously trees grow in kind of different they're perennials it's a little bit different soil than cannabis and the the kind of bro science or whatever with with cannabis growers says oh no no it's in you know cannabis is a grass it's in the transitionary thing whatever where i'm going to with that is are the soils so different that you could not let's say if you had in someone's backyard if you had three blueberry trees and half a dozen cannabis plants whatever your limit is could you plant them among each other or would the blueberry trees mess with the, the cannabis plants or would the cannabis plants mess with the pine tree next door can they interact with each other or do they fight with each other um, based on like the soil pH or the soil fungal dominance? You know where I'm going with that? Yeah, yeah. So like uh, number one, blueberries are bushes, not trees. They're little little three by three, four by four, little shrubs, little summer barren, nasty little things, beautiful, um, need pollinators, all that jazz. But having like what I do is I have a food forest. We have fruit trees of all different colors, sizes, shapes, bushes, vegetables, artichokes, like you saw, different types of things. Uh, the amount of diversity that's in there, going through there, I actually see things like carrots and parsnips, uh, random beets and things that I don't even harvest. 90% of them, I just let them kind of rot in the soil themselves. And plant cannabis among the fruit trees is a big part of what I like to do and what I teach people to do. So it's implemented among the system. Having that diversity is great. They don't need anything different or special or anything radically that's going to change this and say, hey, don't plant this here. There are a few things like pine trees, um, eucalyptus trees, uh, things like that that have tannins and other types of oils and obnoxious things that kind of make it harder for other things to want to grow there. Um, but not usually fruit bearing plants like pretty, you know, fruit bearing plants in general are pretty adaptable. There are more vigorous ones like a walnut or a pecan is going to want to grow 40 foot tall as opposed to like, you know, an apple tree is only going to, you know, around here, a semi dwarf apple is going to get 10, 12 feet, you know, somewhere along those lines. So obviously you don't want to put a bunch of cannabis under your 40 foot growing trees and stuff and, and deal with that. But most things inner planting uh, is the best awesomest most pure at home feeling you can get is wandering through a, a bunch of fruit trees picking stuff off the trees eating that you know looking at all the different types of uh you know bugs and um life that's happening hummingbirds visiting all the different you know flowers and the cover crops and then and then being able to lean over and smell cannabis and have everybody kind of working in that in that in that sim symbiotic relationship that's that's my happy place, man. And there are more places than I can count that I get to go to every day that is just like that. You know, these big places where they got lots of space and lots of money and they just want to grow their own food and be happy. And they also like growing cannabis, you know? So we'll, we create these food forests and, and help them get their, get their, you know, their limits in. And it's kind of a, a very soulful experience. I have this divorce attorney lady and she told me the other day, she's like, you know, I, she never, when I first went to her house, she didn't have any trees, but she has this big place and she never really went outside and she has all this land and all this stuff outside was dying. And she spent all of her time dealing with the, the divorce people and all this bad negative energy all the time. And she wanted some fruit in her backyard. I came over, we planted a couple trees and we, I taught her about the importance of the soil and got her real inspired about, you know, the friggin' the living world around us that she should be, you know, you know, interacting with. And a couple months went by and she called me and was like, man, you've changed my life. I have a better life with my grand, with my granddaughter and my daughter. And I'm happier. I look forward to going outside now. And she even wanted to grow a couple of cannabis plants. She wanted a couple of these CBD one-to-ones, you know, that she'd grow for her and her mother and stuff. And we were able to, to take that. And now she's like this full on gardener with a, with a fuller heart and a happier life just because she gets to wander through, you know, her little mini food forest and, and, and grow the cannabis, you know? Uh, cannabis is a fungally dominant, fungally loving plant, just as anything else. It's a bioaccumulator. So any cannabis that's uh, not used or any extra leaves and stalks and stems always go back to the orchard to cover the ground, to, 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 to refeed what you've taken, you know, from the space. And it's pulled up all kinds of stuff from down deep and really stored it up inside itself. So it's a good, you know, um, 
addition to just the circle of life. So that's, that's kind of what we do. You know, that's, you know, everything, you know, we, you make hash, all the hash stuff goes out to the orchard. Everything goes back to the orchard to where, it, where all those nutrients were taken from, you know? So it's, it's very important. And, and I try to teach people that it's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge part of what, what I want to do. You know, if you, if they did a big, I always say this, but it's important. They, they did a big test on fruits and, and vegetables and uh, from like the forties and fifties. And they compared the same fruits and vegetables from like 2016 or 17, right? And there was up to like 60% uh, nutrient density loss in like an apple. So an apple in the 40s wasn't as nutritious as it is as it, or it was way more nutritious then than it is in 2017, simply because of the, the microbial communities that are supposed to give those microbes to the plant in a certain way. They were bypassed and normal farming and it dropped the nutrition content and the bricks levels and all those types of things which which you know make makes our food less nutritious and you know more along poison and then you're having those problems because you're not feeding them the way that they want to be fed by the things that they want to be fed by so they have problems so you're adding pesticides and friggin fungicides and all this other garbage to the thing and if you believe that weeds are a bad thing then you're adding weed killers and all those other things in addition to that so by the time that apple gets to you today it's a friggin' poison little item that you probably shouldn't even eat, you know? And they say you should wash an apple, a non-organic apple, under a warm water with soap and, and everything for like a ridiculous amount of time. I don't know, it was like 10 minutes or 15 minutes. It's like a yeah, you have to break that whole waxy layer and shit. Yeah. yeah. So you have to really scrub but, the fucker if you eat it. Totally. But they still say that like, like 30% of the pesticides and crap is still in the apple because it absorbs right through the layer. So it's like, the, what the hell is the point you know what i mean so if you don't have to do that and you just understand the plant you're not driving and you just provide the environment for you know the plant to ask for things from you know the living environment around them as long as it has the resources like you know the the, the re-giving the fruit the re-giving of the cannabis the re you know applying to the soil then everything stays in in its in its harmony and, and that's the way it should be done in my opinion I think it's silly that they don't let you grow cannabis and fruit and all kinds of stuff in a lot of the legal situations where they're like, oh, you can't do this and that where, you know, they can benefit. You can have great benefit from each other, you know, and they'll figure that out as as regulation unfolds and stuff. You know, there's some places you can, some places you can't. And there's some rules on that. But um, I think it's a good thing, man. Cool questions. That's what I like to do. That happy place that you were talking about, I think everybody in the chat has seen one of those happy little gardens. And I wonder if it's a happy place on a like intrinsic level. Because for example, we were talking about interplanting and mixing cannabis with this and that. The other thing. That happy garden, it's got bumblebees, it's got little critters running around on the ground, it's got some grass and flowers and everything else, especially in San Diego, it's beautiful. It's got jade plants and everything else. It smells nice, ocean air. Uh, those plants are communicating with each other, right? They're almost communicating with each other through their happiness. And they're sending exudates into the soil and the exudates are attracting the right kinds of bacteria and the right kinds of fungus and the right kinds of little critters and amoebas and paramecians and all that shit, right? Yep. It's like, it's yep. on an intrinsic level, it's like a Disney movie on some level. Yeah, it's cool because you can you can physically see it with your eyes happening, you know, this this magical thing. And there's so many things you can't see that are happening. You know what I mean? And I just wish that I could see all that stuff that's happening on that micro level. You know what I mean? All those little, those little circles and those relationships. And when you really do it, it's no BS, man. I mean, when you become, when your soil is uncovered and you're bacterial dominant, the first phase in fixing that soil is to grow a bunch of friggin' weeds. And every time somebody has tried to refix an old plot of land in your backyard, right? You want to plant a garden in the backyard, right? Some place you, you haven't been gardening at or some shitty part of your yard that you just want to come like it's full of bacteria abundance and nitrates and all these other things the bacteria have created it's the perfect weed food for all the for all the native weeds and plants to want to grow because the first phase for mother nature is to put a bunch of those weeds on the ground to break up the soil with their roots to cover the soil to drop the temperatures to pull nutrients from down low and to when they die, they, they return it to the surface. It, that's a part of the circle. So when people try to refix their land and they're, you know, all in there and then all these weeds pop up, they get pissed off about it. And I've, I'm spending all my time saying, hey, you can't get mad about this. This is this is what is supposed to happen. And if you allow these things to happen you know, and kind of manage it in this way, 
as soon as that ground is covered and becomes more fungally dominant. And we burn through all those years of bad habits of just being this bacterial wasteland. The weeds have no purpose anymore. There's no purpose for them. They, they run out of their purpose. Uh, their whole purpose is to gather the soil, to fix the soil, to cover the soil, to create the life, to make the water, to all those things. And once that's happening, then you don't need them anymore. So therefore, if you become fungally dominant, your weed problem goes down substantially. And it's just, you know, we are taught, and especially fruit, go fruit food growers across the world are still saying weeds were my problem. And they're actually an indicator of your soil health. And we need to really, we need to really start using them the way that we we should, you know what I mean? And that it, it gets us out of trouble faster, you know, so. You can actually see that in like abandoned lots. You know, a lot of people think that some cities will plant trees and stuff around railroads, but a lot of times that's just squirrel droppings and stuff. And so what happens is like, it starts out as just weeds, just dandelions and grass, just bullshit. seems like bullshit, right? You're like, oh, it's just fucking bullshit. But then after a few years, wouldn't you know it, the dandelions brought up some some phosphorus and whatever and the grass broke down and some more squirrels dropped some trees and bushes and some blueberry bushes and whatever else and sure enough it transitioned to something else and it's no longer just weeds it's almost like nature actually has some kind of a purpose to itself it's not a purpose that's the wrong word but it's it's almost as if it kind of knows what it's doing right 100 percent, 125 percent. i was just at a place yesterday sick avocado tree they didn't know what was going on it was doing great Everything was going great. And then all of a sudden it got really sick. We had a heat wave the last couple of weeks, right? They got a new gardener. The gardener cleaned up all the leaves that were underneath of the tree. Avocados are a super surface rooted plant. So all those roots were exposed to the sun during a heat wave, burned up all the roots, pissed off the tree. Tree, and I, I told her, I'm like, the tree is intuitive. So his roots just got nuked. He knows that his cover just got removed, right? Intuitively, he's like, holy cow. I got to get the ground covered so that I can drink water and function and get back to where I was. So what's he do? He drops all his leaves. He sends kill signals to most of his leaves so that he can drop 75% of his leaf mass back down onto the ground to create the shade so that that SOB can start drinking water and doing what he was doing before to create that. And it's an intuitive thing that he, it, it knows that that's what it has to do. And that's the first thing that it will do to fix itself. You know what I mean? And it's, it's silly it's silly to think that there there's not some sort of, you know, system that was already, you know, it's been going on for billions of years. And we are just now starting to understand that, you know, it's not, it's not as easy as throwing some miracle grow on, and stuff on the ground. It's just, it, there's a whole circle of things that, you know, is really going on, but the trees and plants are intuitive. And I, I say it every day, they know what they need to do and they're stuck in a spot. So they have to solve their problems and they do that. They figure out ways to solve their problems via terpenes, via dropping leaves, via cupping their leaves to catch dew and, and things like that to fill their stomach. There's a million things that they do intuitively to save themselves. You know what I mean? When we're trying to hurt them. So it happens all the time, you know, it's just, it's very, very cool. And once you start getting that tree and like, if you have a tree here and a tree here, if there's a bare ground in between those two trees, those two trees are going to have a hard time communicating. You've got different soil temperatures. You've got different moisture levels. You've got different things. You've got dead soil. And most of the time we're caring for individual plants as opposed to caring for the entire soil system. And once you care for the whole soil system and just say F the plants, let's care for the soil. All of a sudden it's the same temperature, same moisture, same, all those things. And for everybody everywhere, like it is in any forest system or place where plants grow. And that's when things turn on and really, really start to grow actually grow you know what i mean and you and you have that and it's it's undeniable when you actually see it see it you know just in action it's just and you look at it under a microscope you can look at the soil life it's just so undeniable that that is the way it's it's not even funny but it's it's a money game out there man and people want to sell their fertilizers and their pesticides and their tricks and their quick fixes and all those things because that's how we eat you know so there's that balance we gotta we gotta sort through the bs but that's my goal man cut through that bs teach people on their own land you don't need that bs do it yourself and then teach your neighbor because the more people that does that the better are we all gonna be you know well said man well said i dude i i couldn't have said it better man you are you are preaching what the eo show is all about Rock and roll. Hell yeah. 
dude we flew through our time tonight too man having a great time with you tonight tyler thanks man i was gonna I'm ask if you tried, everybody out there. have you ever tried growing any kind of uh what the fuck truffles or uh like symbiotic you know edible fungus or anything like that on the tree roots um so you know not truffles in particular and things uh but i inoculate with tons of different types of you know fungal fungal driven teas or mushroom compost is a big thing for me so i do lots of mushroom compost and uh you know you can use you grow mushrooms you can use old mushroom blocks and funny things like that but I don't grow truffles at the roots of the trees. I do grow other root crops and vegetables to feed the organisms there uh, at sugars and carbon and all those things, carrots, parsnips, things like that. I grow underneath the, the, the roots of the trees uh, and plants to just break up the soil and leave little carbon and sugar deposits all throughout the system. You know, that's a big part of what I do. Um, but like, and naturally you'll get mushrooms growing because you become fungally dominant, right? So you'll get natural you know, fungi that, that, that grow in your area. And here in San Diego, we don't have a ton of mushroom varieties here. We're, we're, we're you know, there's, there's mushrooms, obviously there's mushrooms, but there's not as many as if, if you were walking up in the Bay Area or, you know, back East and other places. We're really, we're really low on the actual fruiting bodies and the truffle type mushrooms uh, underneath, but um, lots of fungus, but I do lots of lots of well, planting. Yeah, if, even if you're, you're bringing in like wood chip mulch, you're going to get something that yeah. comes in and break it down you know yeah yeah there are native species and stuff gotta have wood chips man gotta have carbon gotta have stuff it's a, it's armor over your over your skin you know like i said if you're if you look down and see bare ground your your soil's naked and it's sick it's got a fever so We've given uh at least i've given uh keith a uh, blackstone market uh shit for putting wood chips on his soil i was like bro what are you doing why don't you just do something <laughs> else whatever do you recommend uh, indoor, for example, like he's doing it? Has he, has he been laughing all the way to the bank this whole time? Is he the smart one uh, with wood chips indoors? Or do you like to mulch, let's say, even cocoa? Like a lot of people grow with uh, cocoa or, I don't know, probably rockwood. You, you don't, don't want to mulch that. But I mean, like, other than that, soil, soil mixes, stuff like I, that. I always have mulch on my plants indoors. So whether it's uh, straw, whether it's rice holes, whether it's bark chips, uh, smaller bark chips. I always have some sort of cover because I'm a firm believer. Like you've got to cover your skin. You know, you got to cover it. You got to protect it. You got to protect those living things. Also, by having cover, wood chips, straw, other things like that on the surface. When you water, if you're doing a lot of that stuff, it doesn't disturb that surface area of the soil at all, right? So you don't get any disturbance. It's better. It's it's like a filter. It you get. It, it's it's a better situation. The the problem that comes with mulch. Uh, indoors is the bugs, right? So you'll get like, uh, you know, fungus gnats, big thing, right? But that's easy to fix, right? Uh, I'm always using different nematodes. You just get a thing of ne nematodes. Any nursery will sell some tip top nematodes for fungus gnats or whatever. You can order them online anywhere, right? You do one little application of that in your soil, you're not going to have any fungus gnat problems. You can have all the mulch there you want for days and you're going to laugh all the way to the bank in my opinion i think that that is a that is an excellent thing uh there's a couple of commercial farms a lot of places oklahoma um uh, michigan uh, a couple of places that i i know lots of people that are running some facilities and they needed some help in their with with their plants and i'm like dude throw a bunch of straw on half of those and you know don't throw straw on the other half of those and and tell me what what it's like in the next couple of weeks and and they ended up mulching their entire situation afterwards. It's just an easier water. It's better. It provides that cover, that, that layer. Uh, you, you water less, you know, so you got to be mindful of those types of things. And you got to be mindful of the, of the, of the ground uh, critters and things. But most of them aren't harmful. And as long as you deal with the nematodes and stuff, you, you have no, no benefit. But I always, I always encourage people to try if you've got that, uh, you know, if you're available to try, you know, if you're able, shredded mulches work good, shredded webwood, cedar, shredded cedar is great. Uh, All right, what I would like to tap in now, like for me, I like the fact that you say locally source. So the beginning of organic, try to use what you can locally source around it. So fortunately yeah. for us, you know, we had a peanut harvest with some neighbors at some, so they had a whole lot of peanut shells. You yeah. Know? So, you know, Thank I tried them out for a couple of months and, you know, got the kids to stamp on them and, you know, then put them out on the field. But is there anything negative 
that you would not recommend to use as a top jet. Like you would not say, do not mulch with that. Like what, they, you know, yeah. I like parameters. So I like the parameters. So we know I what got you. Is probably the worst thing, you know, don't make, if you can dry it out a little bit, maybe that would be good. Put it on the driveway, you know, whatever it is. Totally. But give, give us some parameters, you know? So no, no pine needles. So if you got a big pine tree, don't bring a bunch of pine needles in your house, you know, uh, and put those on the, on the soil. They have tannins, they've got oils, they're full of mites and thrips and all kinds of problems. You don't use pine needles. Uh, that's like the number one thing. I would never mold with pine needles, even though it kind of seems like a nice little thing. You, you chopped up some pine needles nice and fine, that might be a, a fine mulch. Uh, pine bark would be a better choice. A bark would be better. Um, hands down, no pine needles, no eucalyptus. If you got, you can hear, we got tons of eucalyptus trees, right? They're wild. It's one of the only things that grows around here. It's, it's one of our, you know, common trees. Everybody's always, Hey, can I use this eucalyptus mulch? And it's like, you don't want to use the eucalyptus mulch. If you cut down a eucalyptus tree and you've got a bunch of tree trunks that are aged and you're able to chip those and let those age for a couple of years and let those tannins and crap leach out, then I, you know, carbon is carbon. I think that you could use something like that. But the leaves and those types of barks got lots of bad oils in them that 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 stifle uh, microbial growth and you know aren't beneficial for the plant. So um, no pine needles, have, no eucalyptus. The, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have yeah. to ask, man. Do you have the same problem with cedar? Is cedar going to give you the same issue? I, like I didn't. Types of no, I, I have I use cedar, shredded cedar, because it actually is that insect uh, discourager. Uh, insects don't like cedar and I use a lot of shredded cedar on, on fruit trees and I've brought shredded cedar inside and I've never had a problem with it ever inside ever. I've run full cycles with shredded cedar on the top there. I've never seen like a problem with a plant or, a, or an adverse reaction with the cedar. Um, I like shredded mulches like shredded redwoods, shredded cedars because it's, it's nice and soft and it, and, and it really filters the water. It doesn't dis disrupt the surface of your, of your pots and things like that. But uh, no, cedar, I'm good with cedar. I don't have any, any complaints about it. Um, I've tried it personally and not had an issue with it. Now on a commercial scale, if we were testing things, I'd wanna take it to, to a scientific level. But shoot, man, growing a, a regular, you know, couple light room, running a bunch of cedar on top, no problem. No problem at all, no all right. issue. Thank you. So now on the opposite side, what is the go to mulch? So I know like, you know, I hear Kakuma school say a lot about like top just barley hulls, rice hulls, you know, you have some go to stuff. Apart from local sources, if you, maybe if you live near to a corn factory, maybe you can get like some shredded corn. I don't know, but you know, whatever yep. it is. So the local stuff is always going to be priority. But just for argument's sake, if you had a magic wish list, what would be the top go to? You know, I like uh, even if it's a few of them, a little of this, a little of that. So I want a micronized shredded this, and then a medium shredded this, and a julienne shredded. Yep. <laughs> you know, give me, give me, let me yeah, get yeah. that. No, so so if I was gonna like make uh, you know, a mulch, it wouldn't be one thing because the forest is not one thing. The forest floor is not one thing. It's a bunch of different things collected over time different size particles, different things, different elements, different organisms, right? So I would do a mixture of things. Uh, if I was making, if I really wanted to go to the bank and just just make this special thing, I don't think it's super necessary on the inside. I mean, it's not, it's, but it can't hurt you and it can only be beneficial. So if you're, if you're willing to do it, I like straw, it's cheap. Uh, as long as you can get some organic straw, I have a lot of feed stores around here, right? You can get organic straw, uh, alfalfa, you know, hay, stuff like that you can get. I like the dried straw. That works pretty good. You can use sugar cane leaves. You can use corn husks. You can use um, all the leaf stuff from any tree that you have outside. You want to clean it, you know, you're cleaning up your trees and things. You wash those leaves off, clean those puppies up, and make, make, a, make a leaf cover mulch out of that if you're willing to go that far. That's, you've got the leaf mold. You've got the native, you know, fungi, all those things. Now, doing that you can bring in problems you have to be smart about it right you know there are things that you could do pasteurize there are other things you can do if you didn't care like me and you're willing to throw the diversity in the situation because everybody else is kind of going to be you know able to deal with it my theory is if there's a bunch of good stuff happening and the bad guys show up there's no homes there's no vacancy there's no food for them because there's too much good stuff consuming things living in the space 
occupying the area. So when the bad stuff shows up, they're out competed and consumed immediately. And 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 that's that's my opinion. That's how like the forest works. They're just just the well, good overrides the bad in that excess. You're trying so. to tell me that you have learned to trust the diversity in your ability <laughs> and actually to. do nothing. I'm trying to. Some Be cases careful. I will wash things off. I will not Be deliberately bring in bad things to my home, but I will well, be very well, careful. Some leaf mold. Be very yeah. careful, and I would say find some hobbies. There's some, you know, motorcycling. There's some kids. You know, you have some <laughs> things. Get some hobbies going. Cause once you really discover and really see how easy it is, my brother. Yeah. Then you got yeah. You got time. Yeah, man. You, you're gonna right. need some hobbies. You know. That's, man, I got three kids, bro. I need. I got. I got plenty of hobbies. That's why my my gardening's got to be easy. It's got to be taken care of. You know what I mean? So. My eyes aren't always on on the prize, you know, so I got to, you know, they got to be able to function. And I always tell people, forget what you read, forget what you're told. That's all from human. Look at what happens in nature. Why is that tree growing to 100 foot tall on the side of the road? And nobody does anything to it. Because or at least give it, it the same respect. Give it the same respect. So even if we, we read and you learn a lot, but as you're saying, look at nature and give it equal or even more respect as a better teacher. Yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have to. You have to take the example because, the, 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 you know, the book's written. We're not going to rewrite the book. And that's what all these little games, that's what the cannabis world does. And, like, I, I didn't ever even step foot in the hydroponic store, you know, until, like, five years ago. You know, like, I was, you know, it's a whole different world uh and the way people in cannabis believe and the way that they grow and like just this 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 situation and it's a it's a gimmick it's a gimmick community that's been you know we're always got the new latest greatest nutrient or gizmo or you know thing and it really comes down to like what are you trying to do if you're going commercially in this situation you need to have certain parameters you need to do certain things you need to have these things checked but if you're trying to actually grow the best friggin medicine possible with the least amount of effort in the most sustainable regenerative way there you know that there's that's a whole nother ball game. it's a whole nother it's a whole nother way you know of doing it so it's it's not you know it's not for everybody and there's every there's room for everything you know but that's that's you know i want people to grow trees i want them to grow their own food i don't want people to eat poison I'm tired of people dumping crap on the ground and killing, killing this place. I'm tired of the, the, the valley arguing over the who's wasting water farming trees when all the ground is just uncovered. It's like, well, you're dumb, you know, because you're wasting the water. Nobody's like taking it from you. You're just wasting it. Uh, there's a lot of things that make me angry. So I'm trying to find ways to push out that information, try maybe, maybe inspire a couple other cats to run around and be like, yo, you know, cover that ground, man. Or, well, speaking Find of finding surgery. ways to push out information, why don't you let everybody know where can we find you? Like uh, Instagram, do yeah, you have a Instagram, website? You got, yeah, you got at Family Tree Seeds on Instagram. Okay. Um, you've got Cannabuzz at Family Tree Seeds or Mr. Trees. You can always search that on Cannabuzz. I'm trying to build that up. I ain't got much going on there, but I mean, we got to build that up. Um, I got a new YouTube channel that I just put out where I go over all of my strains uh, history, lineages, stuff like that. Um, and I start doing, you know, Rasta Jeff does it, uh, for some of his strains, he goes through them. So I started, you know, people need the information, you know, from the horse's mouth. So my YouTube channel is family tree seeds, uh, that just got fired up this last week or two ago. So we've been trying to put up some videos There's some information on the, you know, some of the strains that are out at the seed banks and other things. Um, you can email me, you can yell at me. Backyard fruit is, a uh, fruit tree business stuff you can look that up on youtube i got a big channel on there teaching people about fruit trees and other things like that on backyard fruit uh, i'll definitely be subscribing to that but you can you know a bunch of different things like that i mean if you look for mr trees you'll usually find me there's not a lot of me around you know I mean, so you pop that in places you'll find mr trees you know you'll see my cowboy hat and me um uh, there's a you know a bunch of different interviews on regenerative seed co youtube gw smoke break tv you know, grow cast. There's a bunch of places you can hear some weird stories and things uh, from me. But Instagram's good, man. And uh, the YouTube, check out the YouTube. I want to build that up and really get people, you know, you got people got questions and they want to know things about the strains. I want to make that interactive and, uh, you know, more of a place they can go be like, yo, I want to know what's in this strain and why he did it and how we did it this way and how many plants went into it and all these things, you know. So that's, that's what I want to do. I want to you know, but check out the YouTube. Awesome, man. 
Well, it's been great talking with you. And I, you know, with every guest, I always extend the invitation. You, you are welcome back anytime. Doors are always open at the EO show. So Thank if you, you want to come back and hang with us, you are always welcome. Thanks, man. I would love to. I love to. But you. yeah, it's getting to be that time, boys, where we got to wrap up the show. So thank you again, Tyler from Family Tree Seeds. And I'm sure everybody out there caught all that. And if not, look them up again, Instagram, Family Tree Seeds. But that's going to do it for this week, boys. So this is the EO Show, Dirt Man and boys. Peace out. We'll catch y'all on the next one.